Welfare State, uh, Professor Stefan Lundberg, a traditional welcome. Uh, and this is about the rural areas, and it, this is about very much about agriculture. And I have comments on this uh, recent uh, economic and situation of the farmers and the suicides, which I will take up in a while. My lecture here is not really empirical. It's more uh, based on um, a lecture that I gave in Kolkata in March last year. And that lecture was called Unity in Diversity. So how to analyze social change and social mobility in uh, rural India is the topic. And it's, it's both empirical and abstract, what I'm going to say. Now, the, the, the reason why I did this lecture and this chapter in the forthcoming book is that there was a cer ceremony to commemorate a sociologist in Kolkata who died the year before and his name is uh, uh, can you give me the next, next slide Rama Krishna Mukherjee and he was more than eight, 90 years old he, he worked most of his time in India Statistical Institute and he was um, one of the founders of the National Sample Survey. The, the, the design of the National Sample Survey. So, and he was a very important person in Indian sociology and in Indian social science. Because he, can you give me the next? He, 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 he was the true social scientist studying not just one problem but several problems as you can see from this catalogue here and he was very interested also in methodology uh, working with inductive methods you can also say that he was a Marxist at least he he himself calls himself a Marxist and in that sense he had a very strong influence on India's sociology to avoid positivist uh, uh, approach or the American sociological approach. I mean American sociology had a strong influence on Indian sociology but I think uh, Mukherjee was more in the European um, classical tradition so if you say so, you can say that sur in British social anthropology was a more important source of um, inspiration for sociology and social science in India in, in its approach to uh, empirical studies. But I will not dwell on this. I will just dwell on one mind map next, uh, which I've called the sociological mind map. And this is uh, the, the way sociology combines the, s the strong and persistent social categories of class, gender, generation, sexuality, and status, ethnicity. Each of these social categories are linked to society in their own way and have, they are autonomous. But they can also be studied in what is called intersexual relationships. So that the economy, which is the basis of class relation, is also very much present, of course, in gender relations with different uh, work roles of uh, uh, women and men in, in society and so on. So you can combine it, and uh, I'm not going to cover this uh, 25 uh, different um, boxes in any way, but I I'm just going to point out some very important analytical relationships. We take the next. Um, this lecture has uh, an, uh, this uh, 
the paper which I have written ha as an introductory section also about what I think are the salient features of uh, contemporary India. And I point out that this quick development of agriculture in terms of new seeds and new technology and mechanization due to lack of labor and that may come as a surprise but uh, when it's time for sowing or planting or harvesting the farmers have no willing hands around they will work somewhere else in the next village in the nearby town migrating to cities to uh, uh, workers construction labor and so on so mechanization here in India has come about for the same reason uh, that it happened in, in Europe and the United States people didn't choose to work anymore in agriculture they've gone for other uh, occupations um, and the other force is of course the tremendous increased speed of urbanization in terms of uh, developing industry and primarily uh, services and the movement of people from rural areas has accelerated in recent years which you can see in so many new million cities uh, t uh, uh, towns as, as well as in the growth of the the, the real big metropolises like Chennai and Bombay and so on. Yes, next. More yes. Now there is a, we will dwell on cost, but I will just point out in the beginning of this lecture that the relationship with cost, that is ethnicity and class, is very complex today in India because it doesn't go together anymore. In the old society, you could say that uh, class embedded cost, so that one cost was in a high up position or in a low position. This is not true with the changing division of labor anymore. First of all, low cost people and even Dalits have acquired some land and become landowners, which is a class change. And secondly, they have started to work in other occupations. And so the relationship with, between class and class is, in a sense, blurred, so that cost overruns, overtakes, even today, the class uh, relation. If you go to any company in urban or semi-urban area, you'll find that this, the, the workers, the, the same cost both owns the, c the company and w work on the sh floor because giving a person a, a, a good employment is one of the features of the cost associations and cost relations today. But it means that if tr workers try to organize trade unions, they are up against their own family or relatives or caste mates. It make, makes it much more difficult to organize. So caste loyalty is prominent in front of class loyalty. Class loyalty is nothing given by nature or by society. It has always to be built by political and trade union organizational efforts. And just because you failed yesterday, there is no reason to organize today. Failures, you build success on n learning from failures. Uh, this is a background. Uh, I've done this study in Coimbatore. I was in uh, a village south of uh, Madras in 1969-70, coming back in 95. 79-80 uh, saw a, a survey of six villages in the Kavri uh, Delta both dry and wet villages and uh, Dr. Uh, Radha Gopal and uh, Mr. Vidyasaga were both uh, senior researchers in this uh, project and we have published quite a lot uh, about it. We came back after 25 years and what you've seen in various types of publications are following up uh, comparing what 
the situation in 80 and in 2005. Now, <clears throat> I'm just saying very briefly about my understanding of sociology. You, if you look at sociology today in, in universities all over the world, they are very specialized in various studies, family, children, uh, sports, economics, uh, poli uh, so political sociology and so on. But if you uh, look at what, what is the, the core feature of sociology, it's its way of understanding social roles within various institutions, including society as a whole, if you take the role of citizen. But um, so it's a matter of not studying individuals, but the, uh, the studying the social roles that individuals occupy. And then social transformation is about changing rules in changing institutions. Both ways, institutions, new institutions come, old or challenged and uh, changed. And uh, there are new social roles for people. People can use the role and the expectation of the role, say a worker, to organize and challenge uh, and so on. So it's a two-way relationship between social roles, which is a collective feature, not an individual feature. So, for example, when we sociologists study social change, we, we, are, we, we are not walking alone with uh, Amartya Sen, who is studying individual social mobility, how education and um, other capacity buildings. We study collectives of people who occupy and uh, uh, who learn to occupy different social roles and how they act <laughs> these uh, social roles over a period of time. So w if the people are mobile, it's not because they are very clever as individuals, but th because of institutional transformations. Say, um, affirmative action is an institutional transformation creating educated Dalits. Now, these Dalits uh, generally take a, a very strong uh, role in mobilizing their Dalit uh, uh, people in the villages. So they transform their role as middle class, as uh, the creamy layer, by using it for mobilization, which we can say no, see now in, in all parts of India. So. Um, I will just say something about family structure. I'm not a specialist on family sociology, but what we have seen is that most Indian sociologists are not interested in something very self-evident, that most I very mo many Indians live in, in uh, joint or, uh, or extended families. And that today is especially true if you have an old mother or an old father who cannot manage on her own, that she will come and li live in your household, and that it becomes an extended family. But it's also the case that she, she, um, brothers and sisters, children will come to the house in order to study in a nearby school. So in India there are all possible ways that you can see how families, joint families, extended families are composed depending on the needs of various individuals within the family and the kit and kin. But this, so you have this division between a uh, nuclear family, which is one couple and their children, and the extended family, which is one or more uh, married couples living to sharing the same kitchen and, uh, mm, and so on. Or just one mother or single uh, grandfather uh, or, uh, or a cousin or whatever staying in the house, a brother, unmarried brother, for example. So how is this related to the larger society? I mean, the, the general uh, expectation is that your and families will go away and you will have uh, nuclear families. Uh, and that is true in India among wage workers, but not among property people. Either you run a farm, the farm cannot feed the family because uh, of, 
of the uh, rising uh, living uh, costs on the smallness of the land ownership. So uh, the, the, parts, the m family members are working outside agriculture in industry and services. But they, in order to manage this rural urban family economy, you, you pull together your resources so that you can keep your land uh, cultivated and even invest maybe in some irrigation and other soil uh, improvement uh, actions. Uh, so you, you have an advantage of accumulating capital to invest somewhere. And the same goes for a businessman in town, a shopkeeper or uh, running a small workshop. So uh, uh, India's economy today is not just informal, that is 90, more than 90% working without uh, formal uh, uh, rules and regulations, but it's also family based joint family based to a large extent. So that is one, one interesting feature of uh, contemporary uh, transformation in villages. And we found in our 25 years re panel study that uh, data from 1980 and 2005, we found that the joint family has become, uh, could you take the next one, next one, sorry, one back. Yes. Uh, no. Next one. Next one. Hey, this one, on the next one. No, you, you go forward. Yes. So you have one brother who has gone to, to the gap. Next year you go with his help. You have a sister's son in London who can send your, your, uh, your son to him in London for studies. This is networking within the family group which is so important for Indians compared to most other countries in the world. Okay, so that, so much about family. And this is of course, uh, uh, family is of course gender. So economy and gender is actually the analytical dimensions here. How they differ be depending on, on, on how the economy looks like. Now, the next we will have to look at is cost. And um, we go next. Next, cost. It's interesting, this uh, old uh, sociologist Mukherjee, he, he, he did studies in uh, rural West Bengal. And he found something very interesting. There were more joint families in the towns than in the rural areas. The landlords had moved to town in order to have education for children and, and um, access to markets and, uh, and so on. And they practiced uh, joint family. Whereas the landless workers lived near the land in the villages and they had nuclear families. So quite the opposite to uh, general expectations that with urbanization people would go nuclear, families would go nuclear. He could see a pattern of increased joint families in urban areas. And this is exactly what I hinted at when I talked about uh, uh, small business and farming being uh, that the infrastructure, economic infrastructure of joint families. Um, <coughs> we, we have studied uh, cost in 1980, uh, a distribution of cost in 80 and in 19, uh, sorry, 2005. And there is practically no change, except a one change which is significant, and that is that the Brahmins in the canal wet villages have become very a very small minority. They used to own the land and lease it out to tenants who were either medium uh, 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 middle cost people, uh, mut mutradia uh, and so on, or, or to parias, uh, uh, the SC, the Dalit uh, uh, population in the villages. Now the farmers have sold the land. The landlords have sold the land. 
And the, the, this um, SEN Mutradias, they, they cultivate the land. So there has been a transformation in the class structure in the, uh, um, in the villages. Uh, and in the dry villages, uh, the land has not changed the, to the same extent. But SE people have land, dry land. And being landed is very different from being wi without any land. So it gives a kind of social security and status. And the most important thing that we have seen over these 25 years is that people have been mobilized uh, politically. The lower cost, the Dalits have mobilized. Most uh, paramount of this mobilization is the early da Dalit Panther mobilization r uh, running through the Paraya community uh, with uh, Ambedkar as the, uh, the symbol for emancipation. But th this type of mobilization has also come about among the, the other Dalit communities or castes. So the Pallar Muppan, which is here, and uh, uh, the um, Arundatayas have also organized. And they make up about 20% in the dry villages and 35% in the uh, canal irrigated villages. Now, if all the, these people organized in one organization, they would have a considerable influence, in, especially in the wet villages, say in the panchayat or in uh, and so on. But unfortunately, they have divided. They are divided along cost lines. So Arundhati are have their own cost political organization, demanding special. Uh, uh, reservations for Arundhatiars only. And the Pallas have their organization and they used to have the, Dr. Krishna Sami as an MLA here. I don't think he is in the legislative assembly anymore. And, and uh, the, the Parayas have their own organization. So they are, you, you see this split here is weakening the Dalit community, the Dalit class. Uh, yes, we can go on to. Uh, next also. There are no more conflicts than earlier in the villages because the, the intermediate costs, the mutradias, the the Gaunders and uh, the Redias uh, and other communities, they, they still live as if they could keep the SCs down, uh, closing tea shops or discriminating in the tea shop and so on. But the Dalits are now educated. They have people who have studied uh, uh, MA. They, they, they are employed by non-governmental organizations to work in the villages. So this increases the conflict, social conflicts in the villages. The Dalits are not just bowing their backs. So the, it's a very, very different environment in now than it used to be 25 or 50 years ago. It goes for all Dalits and the whole society. Um, I think we take the next talk, so. Uh, it just says what I have said about uh, change of control in land and changing division of labor is the most important economic changes for changes in cost relations. I uh, thought it would be interesting to link. I think there is an element of cost here in recent uh, uh, social change. With the land reforms here in the Calvary Delta, in the, the, the whole Calvary, uh, along the Calvary, the, uh, quite a, a lot of land has come into the possession of the, the SC population. That means that they are new farmers. They used to be tenants. 
but now they are in charge of their own household farm economy which means that they have to negotiate with the capitalist market for inputs and outputs and with the, the, the kind of um, dirty capitalism you have with money lending and, and uh, uh, spurious seeds spurious I insecticides, fertilizers selling bad quality products to the farmers you make life very difficult for the farmers and if you are not in a big family with lots of social networks and political clout it's not easy for the, you to defend yourself so one reason I think it some of the farmers who are in large difficulties they don't have a family history of farming on their own now I, I don't think this is the main uh, reason for the recent 70 uh, suicides desperate acts uh, of farmers. I think there are more important reasons than uh, that they are new farmers. And uh, I would like to point out that the drought, of course, is one such factor which cannot uh, be denied. If there is drought, a crop failure, and you have lots of indebtedness, how can you feed your family? How can you arrange family functions? send people to school student, uh, young people in a family at school and so on it's this absolutely terrible economic situation that makes people commit suicide thinking that it will solve the family problems by some compensation from, from the state and so on so this is one reason but the, the most important reason is fa actually I, and I say this because Tamil Nadu, you know, has not had suicides in its uh, state in among the farmers earlier. It, it, it was common in Punjab, in Maharashtra, uh, for example. But in Tamil Nadu, there has not been any suicide until now. So something has happened. And I think uh, the main factor is the un the the way uh, agriculture is organized during the green revolution there was a very strong state intervention in terms of inputs uh, in terms of credit bringing down the interest rates in credit and uh, 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 and in, in um, ensuring that you could sell your crop at a reasonable rate to make a profit now, the, this system is more or less being dismantled. The public investment in infrastructure has gone down in the recent uh, uh, 20 years, since, especially since 1991. Uh, and um, the cooperatives that were built in the villages during the Green Revolution have l completely lost their role. Instead, it's private business who caters to the input needs so, uh, and the private credit institute which give credit to the farmers. And the farmers now are not all uh, growing uh, paddy and uh, uh, sholam or ragi. They are cultivating vegetables, cash crops, groundnuts, uh, chilies, uh, uh, vegetables of many different kinds. and so they are facing the market as individual economic entrepreneurs and this leaves them in the hands of this middleman the businessman the money lenders and they become very vulnerable so if you combine this with drought and crop failure you can see this as a trigger and once you have had a number of small number of farmers committed suicide it's like a it attack it, it, it spreads to others it gives the others a, a role model oh I can't live with this and my neighbor here he, or the, this farmer in the next village he committed suicide and he was given 3 lakh rupees from the state 
and could the family could clear the debts and so on. So th this is how I look at suicide. Uh, but now I will, uh, excuse me, what is the time now? 12.20. So I have only, I have probably speak for an hour and I have 10 minutes more. So can we take the next picture? Yes, I'm now going to talk about two sociologists. One is Charles Tilly, a sociologist and historian, mostly writing about European, French and uh, French history from the French Revolution in 1789 and that's why he becomes so interesting because he is really dealing with caste and other social categories including then of course uh, ethnicity and status. But his, his scheme for understanding social life is the concept of exploitation. When one group of people can to get a surplus labor from another group of exploitation. And this is one of many that he calls categorical pairs. Can we take the next picture? So uh, social relations can be between people can be very different. And here you have a number of varieties. You have the relation between uh, uh, two people, three people, uh, uh, organization with a middle uh, connecting the organization to the outside. But his significant relationship is this, this what he calls categorical pair. So it's either you own the company or you work in it. You cannot do both in his if you, you have to see the class system in the, in the enterprise uh, on the farm, the farmer and the laborers, the, the industrialist and the laborers. So you can, the, these roles are fixed in a particular historical situation. Now, this categorical ca pair can also be what we have constructed through history, gender relations, man or women. Of course, today people talk about mixed sexuality and, uh, and so on, but historically speaking, up till now, we have two genders, and they relate to each other in what we call paternalistic society, patriarchal power. Men dominate women everywhere, practically, even if some societies have matrilineal inheritance power. It's the men who rule, rule the world. And we are just breaking up from this categorical pair of men on top of women. But we have a very long way to go if you look at society outside. Next picture. So, well, before I say something about uh, the next person here, Charles Tilly has class, he has gender, he has race or ethnicity, so black and white, for example. And even today, in a society like the USA, it matters a lot if you are colored or black, on the one hand, or you are white. And let us see, after Obama, let us see what Donald Trump can do about it. If he can increase racism in American society. We don't know yet. But he wants all Mexicans out. So it's a very relevant category, this black and white, in a racist society like the United States. But also in European societies, race is quite relevant. Especially now that people are fl fleeing away from war, fleeing for their life just to survive. And the Europeans say no, 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 no cattle, no Muslim. This Muslim is the big enemy. And it's a constructed en enemy, of course, by the, the, the rightist and the racist uh, groups. The far extreme right in Europe is growing and constructing the, the Muslim as the evil other. So these three 
things are categorical pair in a particular historical given situation. Uh, in India, of course, racism is more in the hierarchy from white to brown, but also in the hierarchy of caste organized among Varna values. But here, in, and I will talk a little bit about this Varna thing, Varna and um, um, and class. Pata Mukherjee is a sociologist in New Delhi who worked most of his life in Indian Statistical Institute. He is writing about the three concepts, actually the four concepts of exploitation, oppression and discrimination and gender discrimination. So he has four categories. And importantly, what he does is he points out that each of these dimensions has its own autonomy. It cannot be reduced to, to uh, just exploitation, economic exploitation. But political oppression can be there, uh, cultural discrimination can be there, and gender discrimination is almost everywhere. So uh, using a uh, building on these two um, sociologists, I have tried to to understand my own fieldwork in Quimbatore 50 years ago and recent fieldwork among the same people. So we take the next picture. Yeah, here I said something about Amartya Sen's model of mobility, which is based on individuals, whereas my understanding is that it's based on collective roles. Uh, next picture. Yeah, this is a picture taken of uh, adults and children in a village near Pallara, near Tirupur, you know the textile town, uh, between Tir uh, Tirupur and Palladam in, in Coimbatore. And they are so poor. This, this is, uh, they are all uh, Arundatias. Uh, at that time they called themselves Madaris. And they used to work with uh, taking care of the dead cattle and make uh, and tan the skin and stitch big leather buckets to pull up the water from the deep wells for the gounders who owned and operated the, the land. Now in the 60s the electric pumps were, uh, uh, were uh, introduced with electricity and first diesel pump and then electric pumps. And these people were, went out of jobs because the farmers had no interest in uh, employing them anymore. So they were in a completely disastrous and desperate, it was a big tragedy. And I think that uh, many uh, NGOs, including the churches, um, did uh, some good work to just help them to stay alive. But I'm also sure that a, a generation of them died because they didn't have enough to eat. They were starving, meaning that their population did not grow in comparison with other groups in society. Now, I, when I come back here in 2011, or in this case, the, the Oxford e economist who is a colleague of mine, who came back, and this is just a photograph, but the murderers have a completely new class situation. They are specialized agricultural workers. Why? Because all others have left work in agriculture. But the murderers at, at recent times did not have the education and the social network to go to town and start to work in a cotton uh, textile factory or, or so on. So they stayed back and they, uh, they were able to, to, to specialize and they have their own s autonomous small trade unions. They have what is called kotu, we, uh, gangs of laborers make a bidding on harvesting a field or plowing a field or so on. And, and they, um, they, their, their, their living standard has improved tremendously. 
in three, uh, uh, in one, twenty-five percent, more than twenty-five percent of the houses, they can afford that the woman stays at home to give birth to the child, and for the first years, she doesn't need to go to work like before. Before, now. The traditional relation here was, of course, a, a matter of class and religious status. And this is the religious status in, in Quimbator up till 50 years ago. That is this um, Brahmin ritual purity concept. And <coughs> in Quimbator, it was the Gaundus who were the closest to, 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 to God and the murderers were the closest to the unclean, the impure, to, he, to hell. But there was one factor in Quembato district which is very interesting. The murderers were not classified as natives but in, intruders. They, they have a system of right and left hand castes and there are anthropologists like Brenda Beck who studied that. And the left hand costs are outsiders. Even if they have lived in the village for hundreds of years, they're being still being outsiders, not to be trusted the way you can trust insiders. So the others, SC group in this village, the Paraya community, they are counted as right hand cause that they are insiders they can be trusted and they also have much, much easier life than the murderers next picture but here uh, uh, this religious system stood parallel to the class structure and each of these other reinforcing uh, 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 each other so here you have the landowners you have the landless labor and between them there is an absolute categorical di uh, difference uh, and uh, uh, the landowner, the gounder is the king and the laborer is the slave. Okay, next. So this just summarizes the the, the, the combined analysis of class and uh, state, religious, caste, status. Next picture. So I've just said that they, 50 years ago they, they were out of work because of uh, mechanization. But if you look at it today, they are back in. Next. As I told you, they, 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 they make a much better uh, uh, living, a higher living, they higher wages, permanent labor, uh, and uh, every day, more or less, around the year. And women can stay home when they need to look after the children and so on. So it, when they have packer houses, they have toilets, they have ele electricity, uh, it's a completely different situation today, 50 years after. Next. Uh, and I, 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 have, I call this in my own way for reversed opportunity hoarding, meaning that by staying back, they have suddenly become pr privileged as the only ones who can work the land. While Lord others have migrated, they have stayed back. In the end, this meant that they are now in much demand. They drive the tractors, they um, handle the uh, planting machines, they spray the insecticides, they um, dr drive and handle uh, the uh, threshing machines and so on. So they have become specialized workers and they do much better. And they organize in, in gangs who can bargain for higher wages. And they also have taken seats with the 93 uh, uh, change uh, to uh, 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 
decentralized democracy, they now also raised their voice in the local panchayat. So the local government is a completely different thing than in Tamil Nadu. Of course, it was dormant for 40, 50 years, but now m much more active. And the Dalits are raising their voice along with the women. Uh, so political oppression has ac actually diminished as a result of less exploitation in, in, um, in, in agriculture. But, next page. I mean, the, the moderns are still outcast in a way. They are still Dalits. And the more they ask for re uh, uh, reservation and so on, they, the more they reinforce the identity. So, in the end, of course, the Dalit struggle must end with the breakup of endogamy and that people marry <coughs> across. That's the only way. And perhaps it's happening because Indian people are romantic and love <coughs> marriages become more and more common. And I think that this pressure on the traditional marriage system is reflected in the number of honor killings you now have in Tamil Nadu. Especially in the Gounder and the Teva communities you can see how anxiously they, this middle class people, they guard their children. Especially a girl from a Gounder or Teva family marrying a, a, a Dalit boy. It's death punishment. You have so many cases and students who agitate are, are stopped by the police. So this is a normal Tamil business today. Caste oppression is still rampant, but it's also there. This oppression and punishment is there because Dalits challenge it. It's not just there to for its own sake, but it is related to uh, the attempts to change the system. W when the system is challenged and the, the, the old power holders think that the system will collapse, they make resistance. They make this violence against the, the traditionally low costs. So I think this is a sign of things to come that Dalis challenge and that you w the break up of endogamy may come within one, two or, or three generations. First in cities of course, but then also in the rural areas where people are not today backward. Rural people are urban, they have the TV, they have the mobiles, they work in the uh, cities. You can't talk about rural and urban anymore. You, uh, it's one society. And uh, urban people here who have maybe never seen a uh, Yali cat alive, they are now out in the street here in, in Chennai to, to protest against the ban on Yali Kati. So you can see how things link up. And I have just tried in this um, one hour and so on uh, to, to make some remarks about how to go about analyzing social change and transformation in uh, India, especially emphasizing the rural uh, areas. So I thank you for listening so long.
because open for the process. institutions I mean if you go back to 1967 there were not much of um, institutional credit f for the farmers there were land mortgage banks uh, with uh, long term credits for consolidating land and so on but there was not much of land lending from institutions, public institutions. It, the money lending was rampant and that was either money lenders or merchants in, in um, uh, forwarding uh, credit for, uh, against the contract of uh, selling the product to this particular merchant. The, the, um, the murderers were normally indebted, the landless laborers, indebted to the landowners. They were uh, having year-long contracts and they were taking loans from their landowner, their, the, 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 their employer, which they normally never paid back because they instead they had to work for him the next year. But more loose relation, casual labor was very often uh, with money lenders coming from the outside and lending at this 70% a year, 3% or 4% or even more, 6%. So that was the situation. N then the Green Revolution came with the credit cooperatives. And uh, if you take about 1985, 85, say, more than half of all loans for agriculture came from banks and uh, uh, public institutions at 12% interest. And this had a very civilizing impact on the private money lending. So the private money lending, the, their interest rate were also reduced uh, uh, comparatively down to about 20% or so. This is all history now, with uh, uh, 
public financing of a rural credit institute has stopped so that uh, there is nothing. They have to go private again, ra ra rates of interest have increased and, and the, 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 for the, the, the landless worker there is no change. So then in rural areas you have your know, bonded laborers working say on uh, weaving machines in the villages with a, a gound or landowner having a number of laborers sitting by the machines and they are heavily indebted. Low, m more than one year of income is, is their debt and they, never, they are never able to pay it off. So they are in a very difficult situation. Uh, but the, the difference is also that they are now part of the consumer, ca capitalist consumer culture. Even a, a murder, a landless laborer who works, he will have a color television and a mobile phone and he will have a two-wheeler. And it's because of these things and kitchen things and electricity and, and pack a house that they are now into the indebtedness which is so difficult to, to uh, handle for many families. Especially if you not take the recent uh, demonetization which put many workers out of work, they are still having their debts, but no work. How can I feed a family? How can I p repay or service the debts, pay the, the interest uh, due? So, um, the landless never had any, except some small token schemes of uh, NGOs and government lending for buying a cow or what not, uh, some chicken or so on, but n n never had any access to the cheap credit. When it comes to this complex mentioned by uh, Prakash, I think it, uh, you, your question had many, there were many questions in your asking. But if we take land reforms, the, the, the idea was always to compare it with radical land reforms in China, where land was redistributed. And this h hardly happened in India, despite land reforms and the, the, despite te tenancy reforms. What happened decisively was as the Samandari land in m m most often in, uh, in most common in uh, northern parts of India 40% of the land was transferred from feudal samandari laws to the, the, their te chief tenants so you got the, uh, 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 the intermediate costs got more power wh while the feudal uh, landlords had to go into the urban economy to uh, survive with some capital from the land reforms. Otherwise, uh, there have been land reforms in, uh, in uh, Kerala. You take this district, uh, Palgat area, you had land reforms due to the communist uh, regime. And you had land reforms in West Bengal. Uh, and in Kaveri Delta, you have had land reforms because the big Brahmin landlords feared there were some cases of tenants having cultivated land for many generations went to court to say that we are we should have this land from the landlord because we, we, according to the the land reform law we are entitled to it and so uh, the, the high court decision was that the, the land tenants were right. And then the, all the other landlords in the same, in this delta, they started to sell their lands rather than waiting for being uh, a, a verdict in the, in the court that they would have to yield their land at a low price. So a lot of new people have also come in from outside. Radias do not belong to that area, but they bought some of the land. But most of the land has gone to the former tenants or watchmen, overseers, the middle layer, the motoradias, or to the tenants themselves who work the lands with their own hands. 
Now, if you take these things together all over India, the Samindari reform, the West Bengal, the Kerala, and the Tamil Nadu reform, and some other places, there is definitely a movement towards land to the tillers. Less land, the, the land or the traditional landlord is it's very hard to find. He, he belongs to the museum. Only about 25% of land in India is rented out. It used to be more than 50%. And it's rented by big farmers who rent from small farmers, for example, to a certain extent. But they're also rented by landless laborers when they have no work. You, you saw that recently with the... Uh, the, the um, uh, landless laborers somewhere in, uh, I'm not quite sure where it was, Trichy area, who had no work. So they took land on lease and s s have sown this uh, uh, first uh, 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 caddy uh, crop. And then there was doubt. And I couldn't pay back, could pay the interest rate, uh, the tenancy rate. So now they, they are in a very difficult situation. So drought and uh, uh, demonetization have put many people in, in difficulties. Uh, but um, uh, uh, the land reform, the secondary reform, the, the, the various minor land reforms and the indirect reforms, landlords fearing to lose their land at low, co low income. So pre, in order to pre, pre prevent that, I sell it out and send their daughters to London or New York to, to study medicine or work as IT or whatever. So this is a, only a part also, but I, I, I stopped that, Prakash. Please. Do, would you like to? There's one question. Mm -hmm. Another is from different studies. Uh, you mentioned about uh, this term like uh, exploitation, mm -hmm. oppression. Mm -hmm. Do you think the, it will affect our national security overall, matter of India or not? Do you think it will have a be bearing, negative bearing on, post, on national security mm -hmm. of India? Or I'm not a student of international relations. <laughs> if there is made your social transformation in India towards a more democratic society in terms of more land reforms, uh, we are pre preceded by social conflicts, demonstrations, agitations, political mobilization. But if there is a steady process of democratization, not just of the political system, but also the economic system, the workshops and so on, uh, co cooperatives and co-ownership and so on, then India will strengthen its uh, standing in the international community. It will be stronger against feudal Pakistan it will be stronger against uh, um, dictator capitalism in China because it will make fr friends with the whole world. So security is strengthened by the democratization. This is my overall hunch, but I'm not really a political scientist. So can I, um, I'm sorry to intervene and yeah, I want please. to join the discussion. Yeah. But in our view, uh, our view, our understanding is that the people are dying of and the internal security of a country is deeply threatened. Mm. And like, you know, we want to understand what is the security but the border and people dying inside the country. So therefore, like for us, the security is uh, both the internal and the external difference. And uh, even these issues include about oppression and exploitation. These are terminologies not simply of economic orientation, but the state of the society. And internal security is also very important, where about like uh, what they call is non-military threats. And uh, so the military threat is the border, and the non-military threat is equally important for us to understand it. I am convinced that all presidents after the Second World War in the United States have started war, except Jimmy Carter. 
and this has been to address uh, internal political conflicts. So, uh, uh, and the most flagrant example is uh, Margaret Thatcher being criticized inside Britain, starting the Falkland War. And then, uh, once you are in war, the national sentiments are strengthened and your internal differences fade away. So, the, if, uh, if Moody is now threatened, you can see that he will be more active on the foreign side and in, in, in foreign policy because to show that I am the leader of India, whatever you want is Jalikat or, or minor things, we are united in facing the, the Chinese or Pakistan enemy. So he will play on that. And this is what mo many politicians do. They they, they, they divert people's interest from the real issues. And, and, and there was a film called uh, Wagging the Dog, the tail that wagged the dog. That is the president by declaring a war on, on um, e, e internet with a country that didn't exist could capture people. All people had to come together, to work together, united, and make peace internally. So this, th this is a relationship between external and internal security. But I'm quite sure that democratic countries have a, an advantage in the long run over the, uh, authoritarian and feudal countries.